So what is shared intentionality? Well, we all have various perceptions of the world and goals toward things we want to do in the world. And um, other animal species, uh, I believe, have these same kinds of things. They have things they want to accomplish. You know, their behavior, they see the world. And philosophers have used the term intentionality to cover all of that kind of thing. They're directed. My perception is directed at objects. My behavior is directed toward goals. And this is the way the term intentionality has generally been used. Recently, people have started talking about shared intentionality. That is, that you and I can have a shared goal, something we want to accomplish together. And we can have joint attention to something. So we both know that we're attending to this book in front of us. And not only am I attending to it and you're attending to it, I know you're attending to it, and I know you're attending to me attending to it, so we really are jointly, we know, we're mutually aware that we're attending to it. And this um, um, joint goals and joint attention structures much of human activity and much of human uh, communication. Do we share that with Chimpanzees, for example? Well, the jury is still out, but uh, our current, um, our current uh, thought is no. Our current thought is that they do many cooperative things. They um, um, engage in cooperative defense of their territory. Uh, some individuals cooperate in uh, having conflicts with others. Um, in chimpanzees, they do some collaborative hunting of monkeys uh, of uh, one or another kind. And so on the surface, it, it is cooperative. But we think that the human version has some special qualities of, again, having these joint goals and joint attention, and that the uh, non-human primate version doesn't have this underlying structure of shared intentionality. What you just said about shared inten intentionality, that implies a lot of things. For example, knowing that I am I, that you are you, and we, that we both know about that. Yes. Um, <coughs> these collaborative activities with joint goals and joint attention has this dual level structure that there's a shared part, the shared goal for example, and there's the individual part, my role toward that shared goal and your role toward the shared goal. Likewise in joint attention, uh, we both are looking at the book together, we share attention to the book, but you have your perspective and I have my perspective. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we recently argued that the whole notion of perspective depends on the sharedness. We have to have something mm -hmm. on which, some common thing on which we have different perspectives. And without the common thing, we're just seeing different things. We're not having a different perspective on the same thing. Well, a philosopher would probably ask, how do we know that it's the same thing? Because when we two look at a book, for example, we don't know what we look at. Maybe the color, you know, maybe the shape. The philosopher doesn't know, but we know. <laughs> uh, there's very seldom any ambiguity because of the practicalities of what we're doing. So if you and I are, um, let's say that we've decided that um, we're looking for rare books and, and then we um, spy this thing, then we know that what's relevant in our joint attention is the, whether the book is rare or not as we go around looking. And so we're looking for rareness, as it were. Mm -hmm. Or if we're collecting pink things, then you and I can collect, uh, you and I will, uh, and then you point to something and say, look. And then I say, oh, I'm going to focus on the pink color of it. But that presupposes language already. Uh, it doesn't presuppose. Language is a, is a very strong contributor to being able to establish that kind of, we call it common ground. Mm -hmm. But we can establish common ground with a joint activity. So if we're trying to um, make something um, um, together or to solve some problem together, I can make very good inferences about where your attention is focused and what would be relevant to our joint attention based on our shared goals. So, sh so goals determine what we pay attention to and what's relevant. If I'm pursuing a certain goal, then I'll have, if, I'm, if I want to climb a mountain, then I'm um, uh, focusing on how steep it is and where the trails might be. And if I'm going to paint it, I'm focused on its beauty and its colors. And so my, my goals determine what I pay attention to. And so in a joint activity, um, we are jointly making inferences about what the other one is attending to. And it's, if we have a shared goal, then it brings our attention uh, together toward that shared goal. So uh, do I get you right that, you, that you're saying the main difference to primates is that they work parallel in a way, 
but they cannot put themselves into the position of the other. So not in, in shared activities and not the way that humans do it. Parallel might be a little bit strong. They certainly react to one another. So um, in their um, group hunting of monkeys, for example, chimpanzees will... Uh, one individual will start chasing the monkey and another one will go in front where he's running and cut him off and another one will come over to the side and another one will wait on the, bo will wait on the bottom and they are all coordinated with one another in the sense that they know where the other ones are and they're reacting to the other ones. But in our view, and again, the, we don't have the end of the story, this is our working hypothesis as we are doing our research, um, that uh, they don't have the shared goal that we capture the monkey, uh, each of them has the individual goal that I capture the monkey. Mm -hmm. And then maybe we'll share a little bit at the end, but basically it doesn't have the same we structure. What is your theory about the rising of the we you just talked about? Um, <clears throat> Basically, um, you know, these are evolutionary fairy tales about which we can't have a lot of confidence. But uh, again, I think that somewhere along the line, it happened that humans became obligate cooperators, that um, uh, apes and monkeys cooperate in many situations. I don't think it has the same structure as the human version, but they're cooperating in many situations. And there came a point where humans, if you didn't collaborate, then you weren't going to get any food or you weren't going to survive. Um, and there are all kinds of climate changes or um, invasions from other competitors that are taking your food source. And it just came to pass that um, humans began to do collaborative hunting in perhaps some new ways, collaborative gathering where maybe we want to get some honey out of a bee's nest high in the tree and we have to climb on one another's shoulders and hand down the honey. So there are various kinds of... Um, um, food gathering, foraging techniques that become cooperative and any individuals that aren't good at this cooperation can't make it on their own um, um, surviving. And again, the, many other primates do various um, cooperative things, but I don't think any of them absolutely has to in order sur to survive, except possibly some group defense things, but not the foraging things. A few days I just talked to Josef uh, Reichholf, whom you might know, mm -hmm. and his theory is that the rise of agriculture and the rise of culture has a lot to do with common rituals, w which is almost what you uh, were, to were just talking about. And they were connected to alcohol, or the use of alcohol, mm -hmm. which again is used uh, to the, um, uh, connected to the use of grains and ferment fermenting mm -hmm. grains. But it fits into what you're saying. Well, I mean, one way you can look at some things in, modern, in the modern human world, um, and this is sort of the perspective of evolutionary psychology, is that the environment to which we adapted and which many of our cognitive and social skills are adapted is not exactly the one we're living in now. Mm -hmm. And agriculture is the major, major event, uh, agriculture and the rise of cities and civilizations. So when we look at the collaborative activities of young children, which is what we do, um, we're looking at very small scale cooperative activities and maybe there's something like what early humans were doing and something that where they're collaborative foraging for food. But then with agriculture you get big cities and you get uh, a division of labor and you get defense of stored up food and you get administration to keep track of the food and you get laws to make sure people don't steal the food and all of a sudden you get these trappings of civilization. But we are collaborating with others in these um, big cities and large groups with people that we may not even know um, with the, the collaborative skills that evolved in small groups for more local collaborations. I'm still at the point where we differentiate from um, yeah. other primates. Mm -hmm. um, so do you think there is like a genetic reason? Because in terms of genetics we're almost the same, almost. What other possible reason could there be? I spend much of my time looking at <coughs> children on the one hand and apes on the other. They're different. What possible explanation could there be other than there's an evolutionary change uh, that led there? And if you say, oh, but it could be due to culture, not genetics, but where did culture come from? I mean, culture is a product of evolution. But in terms of theory of complexity, there are different or various levels of complexity, mm -hmm. and they have, so to speak, their own regime. 
which is uh, on a specific level you develop uh, your own rules. Mm -hmm. Culture does that, but the ability to do that has to have some evolutionary basis. Um, there had to be, I mean, I think that's the one of the advances in modern evolutionary theory about human beings is the recognition that um, biology and culture are not um, completely different uh, explanatory strategies the way they were in the past. And um, a very general um, characteristic of many species is so-called uh, niche construction. So, for example, ants build anthills, and new ants that are born are adapted for living in anthills. So they are adapted for um, uh, for a part of the environment that was constructed by that very species. And, and so humans, you can think of culture in that way, that we c create and construct our own world, and then future generations end up with genetic adaptations for that world. The human version is different because it's not one thing, like an anthill, but we're adapted for uh, learning from, communicating with, collaborating with, uh, whatever group of individuals we find around us and the artifacts they've created. Plus, there must have been a major, whatever you call it, crack, break, whatever, um, which makes the uh, specific distinction between us and other primates, what you call share intentionality. Yes, yes. And, and um, so um, we start doing things in this we or group way. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I've emphasized a lot is that, um, uh, as a way of kind of crystallizing the argument, is that I believe that if you had a human baby and it was, it grew up outside of any human contact on some desert island somewhere, somehow magically getting food, um, that as an adult, that child's cognitive skills would not be very different from those of other apes, virtually identical. Mm -hmm. right. But growing up in a culture, mm -hmm. The child is learning language, they're learning how to use Arabic numerals and do complicated arithmetic, uh, they're learning how to read and interpret pictures, uh, they're doing all kinds of things that all come from being adapted for and attuned to the knowledge and skills that other people have previously created. Mm -hmm. And we, the individual, him or herself, on a desert island, would, I don't think, create too much. He wouldn't, mean, by himself or herself, um, he wouldn't create a language. He wouldn't create algebra. Where, where would the average person's mathematics skills be with no Arabic numerals, uh, uh, with nobody, if nobody ever taught them any math, and if you didn't even have uh, math uh, number words to count with? What would you invent on your own? And I would say your quantitative skills would end up being very similar to those of chimpanzees who can tell larger and smaller quantities. They can tell the difference between three and two. They can even tell the difference if you put three things in one opaque bucket and two things in another one. They can even remember that there's more here than there is there. So we share a lot of quantitative skills with them. And an individual human's quantitative skills are probably very similar, but when you're in a culture, next thing you know, we're doing algebra and calculus because we can learn from things that other people have invented. But that would strengthen the theory that you know, language, communication, cooperation yeah. developed in nature, which is uh, developed out of you know, genetic reasons yes. or mm. origins. Mm. But once they're there, they have an influence of their own, which is not genetic. Absolutely. That's exactly the dialectic that I think you have to keep in mind and that, and that um, uh, that rules out this kind of simple nature, nurture, genetics environment. They, they, they go together and, the, and we are adapted for uh, cultures. We are adapted for being cultural beings. And, uh, and cult, but culture doesn't have specific content. It's the, it varies across different groups. How important is um, the way you interpret looks or the interpretation of the eye for the rise of cooperation? Joint attention for me is absolutely critical to human communication in particular. 
Communication is something that clearly differentiates us from our nearest relatives. Language is obvious, but even more than language, uh, we have uh, even the simple pointing gesture. If I, again, if we have some uh, joint attention or common ground um, and I point, all of a sudden it's uh, meaningful that we're, we have the common ground that we both like this kind of bicycle or something and I point to it and you know what I mean. Um, but if I point outside of any context whatsoever, it means nothing. If I just point for no reason, it's it, absolutely meaningless. There's no information in the finger. You look over there, you see something, but you don't know exactly what I'm pointing to, and you don't know exactly why I'm pointing to it. So I think this general, what we call common ground, um, comes originally from joint visual attention. Joint visual attention is the concrete form of that, where we both know that we're looking at a certain thing mm -hmm. together, and, and we share attention to it, and that sort of joint visual attention, common visual ground, if, if you will. And then we humans have now gotten to the point where um, we um, have a kind of a um, shared understanding that goes beyond visual perception um, quite a bit. I mean, one example, it, just the other day in the, in the office, so if, if you and I share a secret, let's say that uh, we're gonna hold a surprise birthday party for someone, okay, and we've talked about it and the person enters the room and, and we say we're going to have the party on Friday and the person enters the room and says, oh, I'm going to Berlin on Friday. We don't even have to look at one another, right? We know what the other one is thinking. We both are knowing, oh my goodness, you know, we just planned this party. Okay, and so we both know what the other one is thinking because we just got through discussing this and we know the implications and I know that you can draw the implication that if he's going to Berlin on Friday, then he won't be able to come to the party. And I know that you also know that I make that inference and that you know that I know that you're making that inference. And so this recursive structure of me knowing what, that you know what I know comes originally from I know that you see what I see and you see me seeing you see it, <laughs> okay? Uh, and, and so it comes originally from the concrete sensory motor action in collaborative activities and then it at some point gets up to shared knowledge and common ground. Isn't it strange that um, obviously the uh, primates you work with don't pay much attention to uh, the way I look or where I look, but dogs do that obviously for a very long time. I can give them hints just by you know, moving my eyes in a certain direction. Well, first of all, the, the apes will pay some attention to that. Apes follow gaze direction and in a situation where things are heightened, like there's food around or a predator around, they will, they will be quite attentive to where people are looking. So, yeah. and, and they also, um, they gaze at dominant individuals more than subordinate individuals because they know that's more relevant for their uh, current well-being. Uh, but you're absolutely correct that dogs are perhaps even more attuned and we have some research showing that in some ways they are. But that's, dogs are not normal everyday animals. Dogs are not wolves or something, okay? Dogs have um, a history of somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 12,000 years of being domesticated by humans. Those dogs that fit in well with human society uh, survived and flourished and reproduced, and those dogs that didn't were out on their own and less likely to survive, starting with wolves, of course. Wolves started hanging around human um, societies, and those that could function better with humans um, uh, survive. So, and then later we actually started selecting dogs on purpose for being good communicators uh, with us. The major functions of, um, of domestication for dogs is hunting and herding. And in fact, there are studies showing that when hunter-gatherer groups go hunting with dogs, they are much more successful than without dogs. So they're quite directly relevant to survival. Um, and then herding for the, for the more pastoralists um, with, with animals. And in both of those cases, communication with the human hunters and herders is quite important. So uh, dogs have not just evolved these skills in the natural world with their uh, conspecific canines, they have evolved them specifically to interact with humans. Would you say on this planet we're the only species w uh, which is able to see the other as the other? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by seeing the other as the other. That means I know that I am I, um, you are different, but somehow you're, you're similar to, to me. Uh, you have specific traits, for mm -hmm, example, mm -hmm. um, and I do not interpret um, you as a, a parallel version of myself. 
Well, that implies a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, let, me, let me say, I, I will say it this way, what I feel more confident about. What I feel more confident about is that because we humans are so social, we get this notion of um, what George Herbert Mead called the I and the we, the I and the me. Mm -hmm. So the I is my internal experience of being an agent and acting in the world and whatever, and I'm certain that other m monkeys and apes have the same feeling of I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this and whatever, and then when I interact with you, I know about you in some way. I'm not sure how to conceptualize that, but I know that you're a social being and that you're not me and that you have goals and whatnot on a, on a kind of a concrete level. But what humans also have is this ability to reflect and see myself as the other sees me. Mm -hmm. so, uh, second order. And, and, and yes, yeah, second order. And in fact, what uh, I.A. Cooley called that the looking glass self, the, mm -hmm. the, um, the, the mirror self. So, um, so um, when I got up this morning, uh, you know, I thought about what shirt I should put on given that I'm going to be on television. So I'm thinking about how people are looking at me. So some people have called this self-conscious that I, um, that I um, am uh, monitoring the way that I appear to other people. And so that's a sense of self uh, that um, I think probably uh, only humans have because it comes from this social monitoring of others. And, and I know that you do the same. I know that you're monitoring the way people watch you. And so I'm thinking, okay, um, he's thinking about how he's appearing to me, and then I'm thinking how um, uh, I'm appearing to you, and we're both doing this at the same time. How important are the mirror neurons? for the development of exactly that ability? Well, it's not clear. I would say we still have some research to go. The mirror neurons uh, were discovered in macaque monkeys who don't even really imitate. So um, uh, what their exact function is is not 100% clear. They clearly are involved to some degree because um, uh, they are the thing that enables us to make an equivalence between our goal-directed action and the goal-directed action of others. Um, so they're clearly, I would say, a necessary part of the picture. Uh, whether they are a sufficient uh, answer to those kinds of questions, um, I think probably not because um, at the moment we don't well, I, I should just say that we don't have enough research. We don't really know if the human mirror system uh, is um, s significantly different from the mirror system of other species, partly because we can't probe around in human brains the same for ethical reasons the same way that we can probe around in some other um, animals' um, brains. But um, um, we just don't know whether in humans it's something else in combination with the mirror system or whether the mirror system is somehow different. When you just said that um, chimpanzees hunting, for example, they have an, a sort of, you know, now it becomes difficult to put it into words, imagination, theory of themselves acting. Would you say they have a very basic elementary sort of theory of mind or theory of themselves? Uh, I, I would. And um, the term theory of mind, uh, the problem is it's too broad and we need to uh, be more specific. And um, we have a lot of research demonstrating, at least to our satisfaction, uh, that monkeys understand that um, great apes for sure and monkeys perhaps to some degree understand that others see things. So for example, um, when we're competing, if there's a piece of food that only I can see and you cannot see it, I treat that differently than a piece of food out in the open or one that we both can see. So I understand that the piece of food that only I can see, I have a competitive advantage toward that piece of food, and the one out in the open is a whole different story. Now it depends on who's dominant and all kinds of things. So I think they understand that others see things. I think they understand that others have goals. So we have a number of studies um, showing that um, uh, I react not to your overt specific behavior, but I react to what you're trying to make happen in the world. Um, and I can um, do that uh, regardless of your specific behavior sometimes. I know what you're trying to do. Uh, that comes out clearly when you um, are having a failed attempt. You're trying to um, create, a, you're trying to reach a goal, but you're being unsuccessful. Apes can figure out what goal you're trying to reach, even though you haven't actually reached it overtly in your behavior. So they have a, a um, uh, um, I would say 
I don't like the term theory of mind. I think it, I like theory of action. And so humans have a theory of action that incorporates many mental um, um, uh, entities, as it were. And the apes do too, uh, but they may be a slightly different set. So the apes understand perceptions and goals, and humans understand perceptions and goals, and possibly things like thoughts and beliefs and perspectives and shared things. Um, and, um, and, and beliefs are especially interesting uh, um, uh, mental state because beliefs are, um, in the traditional way of looking at them, beliefs are things that I know might be false. So if I say it's raining, I'm just stating it's raining. If I say I believe it's raining or I think it's raining, I have introduced the possibility that I might be wrong. And so humans seem to not only understand that they themselves might be wrong, but they understand that someone else may have a belief that is in fact wrong, but that their behavior will be driven not by the world, but by their beliefs about the world. And so far we don't have evidence that apes understand beliefs. Now that's a different use of the word belief, but there are some anthropologists saying that uh, religion which is sort of a co cooperative form of yes, belief. Yes. It's very important to form groups and to sustain yes, groups. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, I mean, again, I think uh, in, in that case that um, uh, w there's also some interesting um, research these days talking about uh, music as being mm -hmm. very important right. to groups. And so, so religion would be shared beliefs, shared practices like uh, rituals and mm -hmm. prayers and whatnot. Music as well. And music as well. So music is the way that when you're, getting, you're preparing for war, you're having a funeral, you're celebrating, uh, you play music, everyone moves in synchrony to the music, the... the, the, the um, the natural home to music is in body movement and dance as well. Um, and, and then, of course, the music has a certain mood to it. So f music for a funeral has a different mood than di music for something else. So religion and music and many of these cultural things that um, don't seem to have a specific function, that many people, it's one of the things that leads many people to think of culture as being totally divorced from biology. It doesn't have a specific function. Our aesthetic appreciation of these things, our spiritual appreciation of these things may not have a specific function but the primary function is group cohesion that they bring us together and uh, uh, and uh, I should say also uh, keep us apart so uh, one of the characteristics of religions as well is that um, um, there are um, um, non-believers and heathens that are not part of our belief system and um, one of the characteristics of human cooperation in general is that it um, um, to have to have a sense of we and a group uh, that always is in distinction to others who are not part of our group. Well, maybe one of the um, reasons why we have it is to have a coherent. Yes. Group. Well, I, the um, I'll just tell you what my daughter told me one time. She was forming a little group of friends and she was excluding her next door neighbor. And I said, "That's not nice. You should include her. You should include everybody in your group that wants to be in your group." And she said. That's the whole point of a club, is that uh, some people can't be in it. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, philo philosophically, it's muddy ground now, but would you say that um, primates are able to think? Yes, I, I have no problem with that. Uh, th the term thinking is not a precise term, but for example, um, I'll just give you one very simple example. If, uh, if you hide food in one of two opaque cups, mm -hmm. if you pick up the cup and shake it and it makes noise, of course that's easy, they choose that. But they can also, if you pick up the empty cup and you shake it and there's no noise, they know the food is in the other one. Mm -hmm. So they have to say, to say something to themselves like, the food is in one of those two cups, mm -hmm. it's not in that one, mm -hmm. it must be in this one. Does that have to do with the concept of causality? Yes. So I think their reasoning, um, uh, the philosopher uh, Jose Bermudez is one who has talked about um, the kind of inferences they make are almost always tied to causal reasoning. Mm -hmm. And causal reasoning has uh, typically an if-then structure. If this happened, then that happens. It can have a counterfactual structure. If this doesn't happen, then that won't happen. Uh, or if this doesn't happen, this will happen. Uh, and I think um, animals can reason in that way, certainly great apes, in a number of ways that, that are parallel to formal reasoning in humans, like modus ponens and modus tollens, which is if it's raining, if it rained, the sidewalk is wet, um, uh, where in humans we have these formal 
syllogisms and patterns of reasoning that are true just by virtue of their structure and all that, and I don't really think that animals are doing that kind of formal reasoning, but clearly the basics are in their causal reasoning about what's happening in the world and how they're related in these if-then uh, kinds of sentences. Some people would say that the absolute bedrock of human logical thinking is conditionals, if then, and negation with not. And I think they operate with analogs, not the linguistic formal version that we have, but they operate with analogs of, of, of if then reasoning and, and negation in their causal reasoning about the world. Well, then reasoning is a biological structure, really. Yeah. But, but that's different from thinking, isn't it? Okay, well, I, I said I'm not sure thinking is not a precise term, so you clearly mean something a little different. So what do you mean by thinking? That's a good question. Well, you quote Wittgenstein a lot, and he would say, obviously, you, you have to have a language, and you have to know what you're doing with a specific word in the context of that language. Fine, then animals don't, have, don't think. Okay. <laughs> they don't think if what you mean is the linguistic version of it. Uh, there is something special about thinking in language or linguistic thinking, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that's what Wittgenstein uh, put, put his finger on. Uh, we have um, shared symbols. The thing about um, language from the point of view of shared intentionality, or at least one of the main things, is when we are talking about a book, uh, we share that concept. We both learned it in a um, similar way, and we both know that it can, we can use that to make reference in a similar way. And so now when we uh, use it either to have a conversation or an argument, uh, then it has this common structure. And when we think, some people, Vygotsky in particular, has characterized that kind of thinking as kind of an internalized conversation with yourself. And so you need the language that you would be using to talk to someone else and to argue with someone else. And then you're saying to yourself, well, if I do this, then this will happen. And if I do that, well, maybe I should try this. So when you're talking to yourself, you're essentially having a conversation. Uh, I'm talking to me. And, we're having, um, and you have this conversation. So um, that form of thinking, uh, I would say, is uniquely human. But the basics of logical reasoning, um, I would say, uh, are there in our primate relatives. Well, our, um, this institute in particular was um, founded as um, uh, uh, trying to bring together the Geisteswissenschaften and the Naturwissenschaften perspectives on humans and human evolution. But I've heard that only recently you s severely integrated uh, philosophy. Uh, if, if for me, uh, if, uh, philosophy is kind of um, background prerequisite to doing this kind of thing. And in some fields it's less important. If you're doing molecular genetics, I yeah, think it's not, not so important. But if you're looking at cognitive things and communication and stuff, mm -hmm. then you're working with terms that are not clearly defined uh, ahead of time. And part of your work has to do with defining them and um, relating them to one another before you can actually do the empirical work. From your perspective as a, you know, someone who's working in natural sciences, what do you think philosophers should do? What's, what's their task now in regards to what, what you're, research, what you're researching on? Well, I mean, most, uh, most modern philosophers, certainly most of the young ones, um, um, uh, immerse themselves in a particular science and they learn that science and what's going on and they keep up with the literature and most of the, the young um, interesting philosophers that I interact with um, know all the latest empirical studies and everything and so then they want to um, engage with that material in a different way than we do. We're trying to find out how the world works and they're trying to, they're thinking about what are the concepts involved, what are, how are they used in explanation, um, is this a good explanation or a bad explanation um, and uh, um, reflecting on how the concepts relate to one another and their internal consistency and the logic of the arguments and whatnot. But um, I do think that um, the age of, you know, building a big philosophical system sort of um, divorced from the empirical findings of the natural sciences, that day is gone and, and um, the philosophers should be working with scientists and helping them um, get their conceptual act together, um, uh, um, um, which is more important in some fields than others and certainly in the field of cognitive science it's absolutely critical that um, we have people who have worked with these concepts uh, some and who know some of the history of the concepts and can relate them to one another. But don't you think that one, one, one of the major problems is that when we come back to the problem of thinking, you don't have grades or graduation 
between non-thinking and reasoning and you know maybe thinking in its proper sense as, as, as we use it now? Oh, I think you do. I think we've already talked about some of that. I think that um, causal reasoning about the world and things like that is a kind of an in-between step on the way to human kind of logical thinking. And then when you get shared symbols with which we communicate and which I can then use internally for my own reasoning, um, I, then I think you get something qualitatively different. So at the, at the very least, I would say um, that you could have some animals that you might want to say don't reason, I don't know, maybe some insects. I'm not, I, I haven't ever studied insects, so I don't know, but let's just assume for the moment that insects don't engage in much of anything we'd want to call thinking. But then we have some mammals and primates that I think engage in causal reasoning and, and humans in this kind of shared conceptual linguistic reasoning. So at least we have that level. The kind of motivational side of cooperation. So okay. shared, shared intentionality and that kind of stuff is a little bit more of the structural cognitive side, but mm -hmm. things like altruistic motives and helping and sharing and, mm -hmm. um, and that comes out in communication as well. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, okay. that we, so the, yeah, those are the two things I'd say. The, You all are um, um, in Bonn, is that where it is? Where is it? No. Mainz. Mainz, that's, okay. that's where we produce it. I see. Yeah, ich hab schon. Danke. Yeah, it's close to the uh, ZDF. Mm -hmm. That's sort of one production unit. Okay. It's so interesting that all these questions got a completely different look during the last 10, 15 years. Absolutely. Absolutely. Completely different. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. There's, um, and, and really this kind of um, dichotomy between nature, nurture and stuff I think yeah. is responsible for a lot of it. In the old yeah. days they were yeah. dichotomized and, um, and then there was a sort of transition period where there was kind of... Um, um, genetic mm -hmm. explanations of social behavior were thought to be somehow whatever reactionary right wing mm -hmm. <laughs> something you know mm -hmm. um, and uh, and I think we've moved beyond that now yeah. and we can really yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we can really um, uh, try to see what the facts of the matter are I mean I mean I, I, I don't like to go in the political direction particularly but um, um, the fact that our human cooperation um, I believe has as part of its basis an outgroup, an in-group, outgroup distinction and a, and, a, and a lack of mm -hmm. trust, for a better word, of outgroups is something people don't want to talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, it it, it obviously has obvious political things, but, uh, you know, being, uh, having faith in science, I believe that, um, um, if that if indeed that's a fact, that it's an important fact to have in the discourse. <laughs> <laughs> Müsst ihr euch synchronisieren noch? Nee, die nee. macht es also. Alles gut. gut. Super. Um, when we do cooperate, that seems to have not, not just the structural um, aspect of it, you know, we talked about shared intentionality, it seems to have um, other reasons as well. For example, the motivational structure and maybe um, the idea to achieve something which is beyond what I, as one being, can, can achieve. Yeah. Um, human cooperation, I think, in addition to having this unique structure of shared intentionality, shared goals and joint attention, um, also has some unique motivations. So when we're working towards something together, part of my goal is that you also get your fair share of what we're working toward. And, um, and then in some situations, I can even do altruistic things for you. I help you in various ways. We humans take that sort of for granted um, that if it's a trivial, if I say, if I ask you to pass the salt at the dinner table, um, think how everyone around the table would react if you just said no. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, so it's, if I ask you for a very simple favor, not only are you inclined to do it, but there are actually norms, social norms, that you really have to do it or you will lose reputation. You will be considered um, to be uh, not a very nice person and no one's going to 
um, but cooperate that with doesn't you. doesn't necessarily apply to third parties. Uh, um, it does apply to third parties in the sense that if I see you failing to help someone that you could easily have helped, I think less of you. Mm -hmm. And not only, and if and if I see you stealing something from someone, I definitely. It doesn't have to be from me. That's the part of the point of the cooperative motive. Um, so humans uh, have a tendency to. It's, it, it always balances with your, with your selfish motives. So if I ask you to pass the salt, you sort of have to do it. Um, if I ask you, would you drive to Berlin and get me some salt, then everybody thinks I'm crazy for asking an unreasonable favor. So we have these norms about what is it reasonable, what is a reasonable favor that I can ask of you. And if I ask a reasonable one, then you have to do it or make an excuse why you can't. Uh, but you can't just refuse. And so we have a tendency to cooperate, and, um, and then we have social norms that have built up that says if you don't cooperate as expected, others will either punish you in the strong case, but at the very least, they will think less of you and want to cooperate with you less. So the motivational side of human uh, cooperation has both on the kind of ground level, some altruistic motives that I, I help you if I help the old lady with her mm -hmm. suitcase on the train and I feel good about myself that I helped her. Uh, uh, and so that's just the general motive for um, what um, uh, Adam Smith called um, taking pleasure in the joys of others. Uh, but then in addition, <laughs> we humans <laughs> have developed various forms of punishment and uh, gossip about the reputation of others to make sure that everyone does um, cooperate in the way that is uh, beneficial. But aren't rules very often um, directed against our motivational structure because they want me to do something which out of intention I wouldn't do? The dilemma of human existence, as many novelists have known for a long time, um, is the tension between my individual selfish motives and my social motives for the benefit of the group and the benefit of others. And so we always have that tension. Most social norms have the perspective of the group and what's good for others and good for the group. So in cases where um, I already have an individual desire to help the old lady with her um, suitcase in the train because it's easy and because she looks like she needs help and I'm empathizing with her, then the social norm and my individual motive are totally in line. But if I only have a little bit of food left and the social norm tells me I should share it with you but I'm hungry, now my individual motive and the social norm are at odds with one another. And um, that's, we have, um, all of us in certain situations go with our own selfish motives over social norms of, for the good of the group. And, uh, um, and some people do that are more selfish and others are more group oriented. And so we have individual differences in our general orientation and we have um, situations that drive all of us to be either more selfish or more altruistic um, as well. So there's a lot of variability there, but there's always this constant tension between the individual and the social. Obviously, evolution is a pro evolution. Evolution of culture is a process. Um, now we don't know about this process and how, how it will develop in the future. But what's your guess? Because if it's evolution, it is still continuing. And obviously, there are new things in our cultural environment. Something like the internet, for example, or our fixation to computers, which um, alters the minds of of kids already. Well, again, one of the major um um, theoretical orientations in current study of human evolution is sometimes called evolutionary psychology that focuses on um, the skills that evolved in small group societies, which is where humans have spent most of their um, uh, evolutionary history, and the modern world that is brand new and which we probably have very few specific biological adaptations for. We're still working with the old machinery, as it were. Uh, and it's very, uh, agriculture and cities are only about 10,000 years old or something like that. And so, um, yes, culture is evolving. Culture is going in new places. But it's under the constraint of uh, the abilities that we have evolved um, in, uh, in, in small groups for Doesn't cooperation and communication. Doesn't look too good then, huh? <laughs> no, that's not true. Uh, for example, I think one of the central things about human evolution that explains a lot of 
things that happen in the world is that our abilities and motivations for cooperation evolved in small groups. And it evolved to interact with people that you, um, that you knew well and everything you did was observed by people that you had to interact with tomorrow and you never hardly ever encountered anyone who was a stranger and when you encountered strangers they were from another group and you you basically kept your distance um, and so our cooperation is for others in the group that look like me and talk like me um, and now since agriculture we have cities with people from all different groups and backgrounds interacting together and we have to learn to um, uh, live together. Mm -hmm. Obviously all you have to do is read the news any day to see that we have struggles doing that uh, and it's difficult to do that and we don't trust people from other groups as much as we do from people in our own group and so forth and so on and um, the uh, optimist uh, says that we're making some progress at learning to live with one another and live with others from other groups while having many setbacks along the way but I would say we're getting better better at that than we were in the past. There are now group norms in most um, of the uh, industrialized countries for sure and in many others as well. I'm not an expert on that. Um, there's a group norm against uh, being racist or against being um, 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 saying negative things about people from other groups, um, and so we have we are building group norms that are that are saying this the right thing to do is to is to do it this way is to is to be tolerant of other people's and their different behaviors and to um, and to work with other people from other groups and so. As those norms progress, then uh, that should, it won't always eliminate other, these um, um, other uh, inclinations, but um, uh, I would say we are going in the right direction. Sometimes you wonder why politics is so slow. Uh, it, could be, it could be that the reason is because it's against our biological structure. Be because in terms of reasoning, it makes sense to apply the same rule of you know, being fair to others in every place uh, in which human beings act. But that's obviously not the case. So maybe it's because our biology is slower. Um, I agree with one thing you said, and I disagree with another one. Yes, one of the one of the um, central facts about human evolution that explains many things is that biological evolution is relatively slow and cultural evolution is relatively fast and that explains many things that explains why it is we're in in cities and on television um, uh, uh, whereas some of our cognitive abilities are still the same ones that we had when we lived uh, in in small groups um, but uh, I don't think it's the case that you want to say that our biology is always in the selfish individual direction and the culture is always in the social direction. We, we have both. Our biology is both. In biology, you have, to be some, you have to be looking out for yourself or you won't be leaving any offspring. So if, I'm, if every time I get food, I give it to other people until I starve to death, well, you can say I'm a wonderful person, but I don't have any children who share that trait, and so it won't stay around. So, uh, um, so I can't be totally altruistic, or or I won't I won't leave offspring, and, and it won't persist in the culture. Um, uh, on the other hand, we do ha we do empathize. All of us, when we see a suffering child, pretty much all normal human beings. There may be some pathologies, but pretty much all normal human beings feel a. A, a direct empathy for the suffering child and will do many things to help that child and that is biologically based and natural if I do something bad to you I feel guilty where does guilt come from guilt is a kind of an internalized punishment I'm punishing myself just the way that if you did a bad thing I would do this if I do a bad thing I feel bad about it so um, and guilt is an emotion that I think I don't know, but I think other animals don't have. It comes from our social norms and the internalization of these social norms, but it has a biological basis because it is an emotion. It's a physiological emotion. So guilt is comes both. It's, it's kind, it comes in the direction of this niche construction that we've constructed a social world of cooperation with punishment, and I evolved the emotion of guilt toward myself in reaction to um, this cultural environment where now I preempt your punishing me by going ahead and punishing myself uh, ahead of time. There are actually social psychological studies and I think this fits with everyone's intuition. If you see someone do some bad thing 
and or just say knocking down something, no big deal, but they knock down something. And if they just kind of look at it and walk away, you think, oh, you know, what a, what a bad, per you know, what a jerk, what a bad person. If they look really guilty, like, oh, I didn't mean to, you, you want to forgive them. You want to, and, and, and that's one of the functions of guilt is mm -hmm. you don't have to punish me. I've already done it myself. Mm -hmm. And that's part of it. And then, and then related to that is that I also display for you um, that I have the social norm. You're getting ready to, inter you're getting ready to invoke this norm. And uh, I say, I've already got it. You don't need to worry about it. So I just use that as one example of the interaction, again, between culture and biology. We have biologically evolved social emotions, like guilt uh, uh, is one example. Um, and, but they only make sense in a cultural world in which cooperation is expected and punishment is doled out for non-cooperators. So guilt could not have evolved until we had um, certain kinds of cultural structures in place. What in your career was the most surprising ex experiment you had? <laughs> the most surprising experiment, I would say, is that uh, we have uh, two of them showing that when um, uh, you're having a little bit of a problem, like reaching something, uh, try you can't reach something that's a little too far, uh, chimpanzees will sometimes help you. They will, they will take the object and they will shove it over in your direction. And we have them, for example, when another chimp is trying to get from one room into another room, they'll uh, pull a little string and open the door so he can get in. So it turns out that they have some uh, tendency to help altruistically. Uh, I, should, I should mention straight away that when food is involved, it seems like there's no <laughs> altruistic tendency. So there are other studies showing that when, uh, when, I can, when one chimp can, with, very, with low cost or no cost, deliver a food reward to another individual, they tend not to do it. So when food is involved, they're not very altruistic. But this helping study where it seems like they help if you have a very small problem, like reaching an out-of-reach object, uh, they do help and in our current theoretical um, um, right. orientation that's a little bit of a difficult fact to incorporate so it's the one that's uh, for the moment uh, the most surprising one to me and the, and the hardest one to explain thank you very much for the conversation you're very welcome